Well, thank you for joining me today on our session about rootless containers with Podman. And I hope that over the course of this session, you learn something new, that you look forward to trying out Podman and playing with some rootless containers. And I'm afraid you'll probably realize why I have some trust issues. So here's just a high level view of today's agenda. We're going to cover some of the underlying technology around containers and Podman, but there's an assumption here that this isn't a newbie session. We're not going to do a container 101. So there's an assumption that you know some basics about containers and Docker and the fundamentals of containerization technology. And then we'll dig into the fundamentals of why you would use rootless containers and why you really should care about this. It's quite an important thing. And then we're going to implement it using some simple examples um, and look at one that's gone well and one I'm still having some issues with and what are the positives and negatives are and, and perhaps a few constraints. And hopefully along the way, I'll give you a few pointers on how to get yourself started with uh, running rootless containers. So first we're going to dig into some stuff around container standards. Now, Docker has really kind of kick-started this container revolution. But thanks to groups like the Open Container Initiative, we now have uh, you know, standardized runtime interfaces like Cryo. This means that we now have a standardized way to initialize and run a container image. And Cryo is really important here because ultimately it was designed as a container runtime suitable for Kubernetes. So it will run any OCI compliant Docker compatible container image. So you don't have to build your images with Docker. Your images simply have to meet the standard specification, which was donated by Docker. What OCI means with this and, and what we get out of cryo is that um, we now can have a much more reduced attack surface when it comes to how we start and stop and run initiate containers. Well, it's a key part of the Kubernetes project. And this has a close relationship with Podman. With Podman, what we're doing here is we're taking an alternative approach to the tooling normally associated with Docker. Docker actually presents quite a large attack surface when it comes to running, building, maintaining containers, because it's kind of like a bit of a Swiss army knife. It does lots of different things. It's not just a container standard. It's a way to run a container. It's a way to build a container. It's a way to manage your container images and so forth. We took the decision within uh, Red Hat and our open source communities to kind of split these capabilities into different tools. So Podman's very much focused on how to run a container. Scopio is all about image management and builder. It, it provides us tooling so that we can build a container without some of the overheads associated with Docker. So let's dig into each of these. So Podman is all about giving you a very familiar experience if you're an existing user of the Docker CLI. It's great for running, building and sharing containers outside of platforms like OpenShift just to use it on the command line. And today you can use it on other platforms than Linux in a client server mode. But for today's demo, I'm actually using it natively on a Linux environment. It's easy to be wired into a lot of the ways that you would normally use the Docker CLI today. And thanks to some recent extensions, we now have an API server compatible with the Docker API. It's great at maintaining and running non-root containers and integrates very, very cleanly with things like systemd. And it's pretty much the standard Docker or container runtime interface that we ship as part of things like RHEL, but also in other distributions, particularly Fedora. And we're starting to see adoption outside of kind of the Fedora Red Hat ecosystem quite broadly today because of some of those benefits, particularly the much smaller attack surface. Builder, on the other hand, is all about building OCI compatible container images that match that format as donated by Docker. What's great here is that you can build multiple ways. You can build in that old traditional Docker file way. You can multi-stage builds and layer things up, but you do this outside of the container image. So historically, you needed to initiate a container and then within it, you built its layers up. That could lead to leaving development tools behind, maybe some security keys behind in an image that you didn't want there. 
It also tended to lead to quite large containers. Now, whilst there's tooling out there to let you kind of strip container images down, well, why put things in in the first place? Let's build the container just with the bits we need. And let's set it up so you can build it as a non-root user. So if you've got like multi-user development environments, perhaps a Linux system where many users have got their own shell access, it means that each user can build and manage their own container images without needing to do that as root or without special privileges so that they can access the Docker API over a socket and have Docker run as root and build those container images. Again, much smaller attack surface, better security. So let's talk about why we don't want to get rooted, because this is fairly important. You know, we're being rooted, being attacked, security is a major issue. So why would we talk about this in the context of rootless containers? I've worked in Linux operations for a long time. A large part of my professional career has been helping people run systems at scale. And, you know, in traditional Linux environments, this is mostly a solved problem. You know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, it wasn't uncommon to get an installation guide that said, install this as the root user. Be it from a third party vendor, be it as part of an ISV application, or be it from an internal development team. We need to install this as root because it needs special privileges. We need to install it as root because we don't understand the permission model. We need you to turn SE Linux off because, and there's always a reason. In fact, one of the worst things I ever saw many years ago was a major proprietary application stack, which required in its installation guide for us to leave an X11 console open with screen, uh, screen lock off, with the console open with the management tools running as root. That was one of their core requirements to leave a live root access X11 session running on the console. Thankfully, we've moved on a lot since then, but we've become quite lazy in the container ecosystem. And initially, all container images had to be run as root. When you, you had to be logged in as root to do the run, and internally, most of the systems assumed that the services were effectively running as root. Rootless containers are all about containers that can be created, run and managed by users without any admin access. This adds a number of benefits aside from the security profile. It means that multiple users can run the same containers at the same time without interfering with each other because they're living within their own user space. So why Podman? Well, we mentioned this earlier. It's been fundamentally designed with security in mind and in particular heavily leverages SE Linux. That's more an attack surface because it's just a runtime engine. And all those rootless capabilities are built in. I like the fact that it integrates nicely with systemd. It means I can set up system services that actually run now as containers. And it, overall, it helps me do things like reduce my overall virtual machine footprint. Because many things in the past I might have run as a virtual machine, I can now run as a container. Why should I care? Uh, and I've had people come up to me at other events I've talked to in the past. And even when I'm talking about why rootless matters with, with customers and partners, and they've said, well, I'm good. You know, I have complete control about all my containers. I build them all from scratch. And go, really? Honestly, everything from scratch, including the base operating system, you know, you have cut that level of complete control. Also, you know, you're going to be patching them every time there is a security issue out there in the wild, you've got all that control built in, all that CI CD release management built in. Awesome. But you don't run any community containers, you know, you haven't got a, a Helm chart or a deployment script running somewhere that goes and sucks in some random third party container into your ecosystem. And you're not using any commercial containers. We're starting to see a large number of commercial organizations now ship their software in the form of containers. And they go, well, it's okay because my container platform is so secure. Oh, really? So that's terrific. And maybe it is. But do you trust the other platforms you may be running on? Are you using uh, community builds of your operating system of your container runtime? Are you using a container runtime in the public cloud? Do you know what else is running alongside you in those environments? Are you sure it is as secure as you think it is? 
ultimately, almost all of us consume some kind of base OS that we build our containers up from. Unless you're a Golang user and, and you're just building a pure binary. So common use cases are things like Alpine and Ubuntu. In the Linux and the Red Hat ecosystem, we have our RHEL UBI images. And, and we now have three of those, uh, or four of those actually, depending on the kind of type of image you wish to deploy. And we'll show some of those off as we go through today's demo. Microsoft SQL Server now even ships based off our UBI image. It means that they get the security and stability of running on top of a RHEL baseline image. But the UBI image is great because it's freely redistributable. So you can build your own redistributable containers on top of a known enterprise ready container baseline. But despite this, I'm paranoid. So I want to know that my environment is as secure as possible, so I want to be able to run things rootless. And this becomes even more important when you start looking at the number of vulnerabilities that have been out there over the last few years. Just the basic vulnerability scan of all the containers inside things like Docker Hub shows a huge number of critical vulnerabilities. Um, the, prior to us acquiring Stackrocks recently, uh, their previous security report said 90% of respondents had had a security incident. The latest report from this year was up that to 94%. There are always new security risks and issues out there today. No matter of where you're consuming Docker or Kubernetes or your container runtime from. So let's go rootless. Let's avoid that pain and that headache. When I'm trying to build a demo or a scenario or do something for a community talk even, I try and put myself into a degree in the mind of a customer of an end user. So I want to validate the technology, but to follow through on this, I also want to do it in a way that excites me. So I'll pick up something, I'll try and make sure I do things in a sensible way, but I want to do something that's cool and fun. But I try and avoid cutting corners, mostly. It's my lab, it's my environment, I know which corners I can cut, but also I have to think about, well, if I was doing this for real for a customer, what would they be doing? How would they be deploying this? Because all too often, some of the blueprints I've used for myself, I've ended up using with a customer in the field. And also I thought, what do I need that could or should be in a container? What do I need? And ideally using a third party container, therefore I do have that potential attack vector on my environment. Now this, this is where it comes down to the issues we all face, whether it's running our own lab, our own home environment, or it's running things inside a business organization at scale. There's always existing services that are very hard to replatform or refactor. So I've got some home websites. I run a track system for my subversion and Git. I still hack around on things like Myth TV. There's a bunch of things I just have every day around my home environment. But what's cool? What's shiny? What do I want to play with today? Home automation. And so like many people, I want to play with home automation. I thought, well, great. Well, I'll go and run that in some containers. It's a great way to try it out. Don't need some new virtual machines, low overhead. Awesome. Let's give this a go. So Podman, if we're going to run rootless, what do we need? Now, really today, Podman 3. 164 or newer depends on what's shipped as part of your favorite distro was available today. 2.x plus sorted out a lot of rootless issues. Each release deals with more edge cases and pain points. Uh, we need an additional package around the network layer to make sure we've got the right network components required for running these rootless services and all the, all the networky bits under the hood. We also need to make sure we've got the right number of user namespaces. Um, effectively, each user ends up consuming additional namespaces for when they run these rootless containers. And also, are you running these containers as a user, traditional user, or are you running them as a system user? So if I'm running these things as a system user, then I may need to go and add some additional um, sub UID and sub GID entries for that system user because they won't be uh, automatically created as part of user creation. So confirm the version of Podman. In this particular case, 
323 is the latest build, fairly recent, and I'm actually going to be running it for the purposes of the demo on RHEL 8.4, just to prove I've got a real environment here. So there's the version of Red, Red Hat I'm running. If I do Podman version, there's the details. So this is a simple uh, RHEL VM image that I can kickstart and recreate really, really quickly on my home KVM server for the purposes of doing quick labs and demos. So rootless options. So uh, I want to first do some testing. I'll just create a dummy user called Fred. Hey Fred, how are you doing today? So I'm going to make sure Fred isn't running things as root. And so I want to go and pull an image. I want to run an image. Uh, and I want to make sure that the services inside it are running or not running as root. So first of all, the, the, the left-hand example here is running a service where inside the container you're running as root, but you're outside the container you're running as a non-root user. Now the second side is that when you run a process inside the container, I want to run it as a non-root user. This is something we'll kind of come back to later in the talk, but it is a an issue. Many containers you get off the shelf from a container registry today are actually built so that the services internally are running still as root. That means if you run it as root on the outside and you're running things as root on the inside, you're actually creating a higher uh, attack surface and potential risk. Ideally, modern containers should be getting defined now so that the services within them are still running as non-root users, much as you would do on a traditional Linux platform. So let's take a quick look at this inside our test environment here. So if I do su minus Fred, and I do podman version, there we go, we're good. Now, if I do podman images, you can see I've already pulled down our Red Hat UBI base image, and it's a nice small image, it's just you know 38 meg. If I run ID, there's our user Fred and his context and his details. And I now go and run my image and do ID. I'm now running internally as root. Okay. So let's rerun our command now again. This time I'm going to run as the user nobody. Now if I do ID, I'm running as the user nobody within our container image. So if I do who am I? I am nobody. And just to prove the big difference between being inside this container and being an outside in the base OS, if I do ls user bin. You can see that's the number of commands I've got available today. This is the mass software installed. I jump out of this in LS in a conventional rel, relatively small image. I've got a heck of a lot more things installed. So I've got a nice small image and up and running as, and I'm able to run that as a non root user. So that's a really nice simple test as kind of a baseline to make sure you can actually do things rootless. I do podman ps, much as you would run docker ps, you can see I've got no running images. And if I actually do ps minus a, you can see there's the images I was running earlier that I've now exited. So as we said, uh, podman's interchangeable as with docker as a run container engine. Run C is actually the OCI compatible container runtime that it initiates. So Podman just acts as the overlay for that OCI compatible runtime. Um, and we've just gone through a few of those commands now, just looking what images we've got and uh, making sure that the containers we're, we're running have now stopped. So just a few standard basic commands, much as you'd expect running Docker. So now we're going to move on to the, the core of the talk where we're going to play with Home Assistant. Now, I just need to give a really quick shout out to an old friend of mine, Chris Smart. I find every time I want to go and play with something, some new technology, Chris is probably playing with it already and is already kicking the tires and, and, and worked out a few edge cases. So when I first looked at this uh, close to two years ago, Chris had already found a few issues, particularly with rootless containers. 
he was playing with Fedora. I'm going to be doing it on top of RHEL, and that's where I started to hit a few things that he hadn't seen, which was useful because I ended up having to being able to help our engineering team resolve a few bugs. So let's uh, let's create the environment. So what we're going to do, we'll set up an initial user for running Home Assistant called Has. We're going to make this a system user, run it in via lib rather than home. Because we're running it as a system type user, I need to go and create those additional uh, UIDs. So once they're in place, we now need to create the config directories with the right SE Linux permissions. So they need a few extra SE Linux contexts uh, um, uh, applied. And if I act, and then we need to expose the service. I want to be able to connect to this service. And just to prove right now, I can't connect to the service because it's not running. There's no service running on that port on my um, in virtual machine pod two. So let's jump into the environment here and become my user has. Now here I've already created those uh, directories, the config and the SSL. And I'm actually going ahead of myself because I've already got my mosquito uh, directory, which I'll be coming back to a little later in the talk. But those environments, things have already been set up. In fact, to help speed things up, I've actually previously pulled down the Home Assistant images as well as my mosquito images. So they're already pre-cached. As you can see, I, I updated those caches just shortly before recording this talk. So let's do some initial testing. I'm now the user. Let's actually run our Home Assistant image. Now this is something I highly recommend is before you start getting too carried away, do a bit of basic testing. So I'm going to run that image. And there's an ID. If I do podman ps, I can see the image is running. If I do podman logs minus f, has, I can now see the logs of the container image coming up. Awesome. Let's go back to our web browser here and I should be able to hit refresh and now we've got, we can, this is a brand new environment. I can now go in and configure it from, from scratch. So it's Steve, Steve, a really hard to remember password and no, I don't live in Amsterdam, but we'll pretend and I'm going to say I'm in NZD because I'm based in Auckland, New Zealand. So I can now go through and finish my configuration of Home Assistant. But all that data is actually being persisted in those directories outside of the container. So if I do see the container running, I can now stop and remove the container, remove the runtime image. That's now gone. And if I jump back here, it's giving me a warning because the connection's been lost and that's gone away. That easy. But all that data lives under here. So as I configure it, the data is separated from the runtime. This makes things like backup so much simpler. I can just easily shut down the container, backup a very, very small set of directories, and recreating it is just as simple as starting the container back up again. But what I want to do now is enable it as a service. I want to have it always available. So when I my uh, virtual machine restarts, it goes and brings the uh, service back online. So as the root user, I can run the following. Oops, getting ahead of myself. So I can create a systemd service and make sure it's running exactly the same start command, but I make sure it runs as the user and group has. Now, one thing about systemd, it's also a bit of a Swiss Army knife. So there's several ways of doing this. This is just one example, but I'm telling it that I want this to run whenever it's running as a multi-user target. When I do a reload, it's gonna make sure it does a stop and a, and a remove. So it removes the named environment before it brings it back up again. 
and so there's my um, kind of system D service definition for has. Now next part of this turns out for some of my devices I need an MQTT broker. One reason is I'm playing around with a number of smart plug type devices. So I've got a number of these simple smart plugs that can be easily reflashed with Tasmota, which is an open source firmware replacement for a bunch of commonly available plugs. Now, word of warning, be careful. Uh, a number of the Toya, TUIA based um, devices now have a much newer firmware that's far harder to flash. I was lucky I've got a few of the older devices and so I was able to very easily do a, a Wi-Fi based over the air uh, flash of these into an open source firmware. Uh, with newer versions of Home Assistant there's ways of configuring them with that MQTT but I need an MQTT broker for some other things I'm running as well. Now out there today again there's a really nice off the shelf broker image of a mosquito and I can going to be fairly lazy here as I said occasionally we take some shortcuts I should really run it under a different user but it's so closely coupled with my home assistant environment I'm going to run it as the same user so let's jump in uh, now there was one gotcha though now when I first started using this the default image off the shelf behaved the way I wanted that's now been changed and revised. So the latest image, in order to have it listen on the correct ports and behave the way I want, I actually now need to provide a config. So I now actually have this mosquito directory and in it I have a simple config file. It simply says, turn on the listener on the port I want and allow anonymous access. Because at the moment for these plugs, the way they're set up, they actually live on their own separate VLAN, their own separate Wi-Fi network and I'm not putting any extra security on them at present. Over time, if I want to do proper security handling for MQTT, then I can update the Mosquito config. But at the moment, it's pretty simple. Kind of lazy, I know, but I have at least isolated the network. So let's have a look back in my environment over here. Clear. So there's my config file and then this is sufficient to do a test run of mosquito uh, running and then I, if I fire up one of my devices and you know turn the power on and off we'll see the messages come through on the messaging bus here right. and then if I do podman PS, not running podman ps minus a you can see where it were good it's all gone away now like has I want it to run as a system D service and have it come back up when I restart the environment so this is all I require now for the most part this is pretty good behaves reasonably stably but I'll come to a couple of troubleshooting um, tips towards the end of the session so for the most part this works well. I have a separate virtual machine that has my live environment and when it comes up Home Assistant starts, MQTT starts, all my devices start synchronizing and everything behaves nicely and it has greatly simplified things like backup and recovery. But I want to run other things. So one other one I, I used to run for a while and then I got a new TV and thought it'd be really nice to have as mini DLNA in a container. Uh, but I found it has some issues trying to do uh, attach NFS based volumes when you're running as a non root user. So for the purpose of showing this off, I'm going to drop back into my, my one of my test users. But here's some examples of how you set up volumes with Podman. So with Podman, you can create volumes you want to attach into your containers at runtime. These can be remote NFS endpoints. Now, if I run these commands as root, everything behaves nicely. It doesn't behave so well when I'm running as a non-root user. Now, I have flagged this to some of the Podman development team, and it is something they're working on in the background. So hopefully we'll have a solution soon. A simple way around this would be 
use something like AutoFS or have it in the FS tab on the container host that these volumes are being mounted somewhere that the container can access. But I quite like the way we should be able to closely couple the, the whole environment. So the volumes are associated with the image. So let's just jump back to our test user from earlier. Clear, Mr. Fred. If I do podman volume uh, list, you can see there's my volumes, audio and video vol. Now, uh, now if I do I'm not going to actually use the mini DLNA container. I'm just going to use my UBI container again because it's really nice for simple debugging. All I want to do is attach that video vol volume as month video vol inside my uh, UBI container. And now I get an access issue. So hopefully that'll be fixed soon. This thing doesn't happen when I run it as root. So uh, that I said there are other workarounds, but at the moment it does show you there are some limitations and issues when you're trying to run services as um, a non-root user. So your mileage may vary, but try and change the way your developers work and the way your system teams work and have them make sure that the, the containers that they're developing and producing are rootless friendly. So where are we today? Frustrating, oh, I had a world of pain at the beginning. Um, it wasn't entirely fully functional for some of the workloads I was looking at. On rel 8.1 I had some real weird memory issues but I managed to get an early engineering build of Podman ahead of the GA of rel 8.2 that resolved the issues and it's been great ever since. I wouldn't have had those issues on Fedora if I'd been running upstream Podman. It was just that I'm working with what my customers would work with, the one that we ship as part of the distro and you know, Podman's been through quite a lot of major revisions recently. It's the point where we've now shipping Podman 3 as part of RHEL 8.4. And as I've said, I've got these issues with uh, NFS volume management. Bad. As I said, not all containers are ready to be rootless and it isn't easy to identify which ones will or won't work. You kind of got to go and uh, kick the tires yourself. And often you're still running as root inside the container, even if you're not running as root outside. So you do get a layer of security, but it's not where I ideally want to be. Uh, crash consistency issues. I um, had a power outage and the host that was running my virtual machine that runs the pods went down and then didn't come back up again very cleanly. The virtual machine did, the pods didn't. I had to do a bit of cleanup. That's improved with each release of Podman. Uh, if you do get things in a bad state, I've got a couple of troubleshooting tips later on. The most common one is that you just sometimes need, particularly with systemd services, is do a systemd stop. Uh, make sure that there's no lingering uh, redundant uh, pods left lying around, then bring everything back up again. What I like though is management. Day-to-day -day management's easy. It's very easy to update things. Very easy to back up because configuration and data are very, very separated from the actual environment. I'm not backing up an entire operating system every time I want to uh, do a backup. I just have to back up data. And because the way containers are tagged, I can potentially roll back to a much older release of a service that I'm running. I feel quite safe doing this with some community containers. Um, So let's, um, what else have we got? Troubleshooting. Overall, most troubleshooting is very similar to Docker. You can look for your old dead images. You can look at the system logs we showed earlier for each container as they're running. Start, stop, remove image. Uh, system prune is a really handy command. I'll show you that shortly. If you are using systemd, avoid starting and stopping containers manually. If you flick between systemd and then podman start, podman stop, uh, things can get a little out of sync. Sometimes you just need to go and do a tidy up. Most of the time, just use the systemctl command, start and stop the services as and when you need them. Up upgrading workloads. 
um, you can pre-cache the upgrade. So I can go and pull the new image while the service is still running. And then all I need to do is restart the service and it will now find the new image. It's already been downloaded. That's great if you don't want your service to be down for five or 10 minutes while it's trying to find the latest container image and sync it, particularly if you're dealing with really big container images. Upgrading Podman itself. Um, this is where things can get interesting. Well, when I went to first do this updated version of the talk, um, I was running a much older version of Podman and I thought, oh, well, just upgrade and everything's good and nothing quite worked. Podman system is a great little maintenance command. There's a few useful things here, prune, reset or two in particular. Um, if you performed a major upgrade, Podman system migrate will do a lot of the tidy up tasks you need to make sure the environment's configured correctly, uh, remove redundant configs, and, and upgrade a few things so that it's aligned with the version of run C Podman, etc. that's now on your host. If you are still experiencing issues, Podman system reset will go a little bit further and clean out a bunch of redundant data. Now this is Podman data, not your application data, because that's living outside of your pods. It's still safe. So uh, I've yet to experience any major problems running these commands. Podman maintenance or Podman system prune is really handy. Anyone who runs a lot of containers or is doing a lot of uh, container image building, you end up with a lot of redundant containers and redundant uh, environment information. So this is a great way of tidying things up and dealing with dam dangling images and dangling builds and things you no longer need on your system. I'll just show this one off pr briefly. If I become my has user again, I do podman images, you'll see I've got some dangling images. This is because I upgraded the version of Home Assistant I had earlier and the tagging's changed. So the newer images are now tagged as latest. Whereas if I now run podman system prune, time to go ahead, It'll now go and do a cleanup of my user's environment and it's now reclaimed a chunk of space from my environment and tidied a few other things up for me. So again, Podman is great at just general maintenance. Very, very useful. A few references for you. Uh, there's some great links out there on how to get started with Podman. Uh, Podman basics, what's actually happening behind the scenes uh, when you're running rootless containers with Podman. And there's a video series we've been pushing out recently. One I do want to raise in particular is our Podman Catacoda tutorial. This is an awesome way to get your hands dirty with Podman today without actually installing anything yourself. So if I jump back to my uh, web browser here and just jump over a tab, this environment allows you to deploy containers and manage them with Podman without ever having to install anything yourself. So this is a lab hosted environment operated by Red Hat. You don't need any kind of logins to come and play with this and you can go and get your hands dirty today and try out Podman. So take a look at this. There's a bunch of other container centric labs that we have available today and that you can use without any charge. They're just available today through the Red Hat Labs environment. So please jump in have a play, try it out. So thank you all so much for your time and for joining us today. Hopefully I've got you interested in playing with Podman. Please reach out if you have any queries or questions. You can find me on Twitter or you can find me on my people page at Red Hat where a copy of this talk uh, and all the slides will be made available shortly. Um, and also let me know if you find a way to hack the more modern versions of these plugs. I do keep an eye on the, the, the various um, uh, Tasmota wikis and and um, their GitHub site to see if there's been any recent changes. It'd be great to find that we can continue to uh, put open source firmware on proprietary hardware. So once again, thank you all for your time and please let me know if you've got any questions.